Okay, everybody, this is uh, Northeastern University College of Arts, Media, and Design, a media service organization, uh, Humanics and Media Technology Speaker Series. My name is Benjamin Karras, and I work in the, uh, Professor Karras, and I work in the makerspace, teaching young, uh, our students how to make things. Um, I would like to introduce, oh, before we get started, let's take care of a little housekeeping here. All participants, all participants will be muted and won't be able to screen share throughout this event. The event is being recorded and will be posted on the website and social media outlets following the event. And we'll be using the chat box in the event for questions and comments. So feel free, free to comment any questions that you may have into the chat box and uh, we'll ask them a little later on. Um, I'd like to welcome today Ph Phyllis Klein. She is the co-founder of Fab Lab D DC, indep an independent nonprofit digital fabrication lab in Washington, DC. Fab Lab DC creates opportunities by offering workshop workshops, exhibitions, events, and speaker series, and connecting people to an international network of Fab Labs. Phyllis served on the steering committee to establish the International Fab Lab Association and as a member of the support seat team for Fab Lab Foundation and Fab Academy. She collaborates with the Fab Foundation and MIT to support and advance the global Fab Lab network. She also likes to make things. I, so do I. I don't, can't blame you for that. Without further ado, Phyllis Klein. Oh, Phyllis. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, and thank you, Kelly, for inviting me. Um, I want to thank everybody who's tuning in too. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that um, I can share some images uh, while I, I talk. And I'll just talk for a bit and then I hope we can follow up with questions and, and discussion. So um, I'm going to share my screen now. Oh, I think it needs to be enabled again, Kelly. Screen sharing, that is. Okay, sorry. Let me uh, make, I'll make you co-host. Yes. Okay. So you should be able to. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, I was telling Kelly that, you know, a lot's happened since we, we first, uh, I was paused. Let's see. Okay. Um, a lot has happened since uh, we first, I was first invited to create this talk. Um, but I think um, tying this in with humantics, humanics, um, uh, it's all relevant. The, um, the COVID situation that we're facing, uh, the political challenges, um, and of course, always in the background, but really more pressing is, is uh, the climate crisis. Um, and I think that all of this uh, does tie into the notion that um, Joseph Aoun has um, put forth in the book that we've, we've been considering, um, Robot Proof. Um, and I think it's, it's closely related to Fab Labs and, and the Global Fab Lab Network. Um, uh, before we've all had to isolate, um, Fab Lab was a, a vibrant community um, engagement space, um, not only for workshops, events, speaker series, and exhibitions. Um, we also did a lot of interfacing with uh, educators, um, people in government, and also in business, uh, a lot of advocacy around um, alternative learning. And we first got started in this in 2010, and back then, a uh, few people had actually heard of a fab lab. Um, people had heard of um, 
maker spaces to some extent, but it, it was quite a, a small following. And what's been impressive is that over the 10 years that I've been involved with the Fab Lab Network, um, making has been more accepted in mainstream as a legitimate learning tool and adapted both in um, public school settings, K through 12, and of course uh, at university. Um, but back when we got started, um, it was quite difficult to convince people that this experimental type learning that you didn't measure in the same way as traditional education uh, was of, of value, aside from it being fun. Um, and so um, I think that time has shown that with its adaptation and as um, uh, Professor Aoun uh, points out in his book that, um, you know, there's many, many routes to arrive at the way people learn and what we need to do in order to um, create the changes both personally and, and collectively. And people flock to, to these types of opportunities. There's a, you know, such a high degree of curiosity um, and even children as young as five, um, their imagination and creativity and willingness to just roll up their sleeves and, and make things. Um, this is a group of elementary school students who are taking on the roles of city planners and imagining the city of the future. One of the really fun inventions from one of the very young children was to devise, because we're also considering modes of transportation, was to devise a vehicle that um, was actually run on human hair. It was fueled by human hair, a renewable resource. Um, some of the older children uh, went the more traditional route, but um, the collective um, innovations and uh, proximity of the kids and their ideas uh, was really a, a wonderful experience. Um, here at Fab Lab DC, we, we're also a model lab. And so we have visitors who are either staying in DC for, for a period of work or study or people who are coming through that, that fit, come to visit us to see what a lab is all about. Because you can talk about it, but until you actually walk through and experience it, maybe even make a thing, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's more than, than the concept. So um, these are some visitors that, some of the most recent visitors that we've had come by. And at the heart of the FAB experience is, is really asking questions uh, about what if. And, and one of the questions uh, that we emerge from is, if you could make anything, what would it be? And you can substitute make with if you could do anything or if you could change anything. Um, but this question um, is, is actually at the heart of how Fab Lab got started, which was at an institution uh, at MIT, the Center for Bits and Atoms, where you know, Gershenfeld had received a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to create a state-of-the-art lab to do his research. Um, Many of you know that Professor Gershenfeld is a physicist um, who has told us he never really saw the distinction between physical science and computational science. And as a layperson, uh, I can understand that because after all, um, we're made of code. Um, and so he began to experiment with turning code into things, into physical things. And in order to give his grad students a leg up to be able to utilize the machines, he developed a course called How to Make Almost Anything. Um, so expecting 12 students um, to sign up, he was surprised when um, you know, 200 students are trying to sign up for the course, uh, students across campus and across disciplines. Um, and as this happened, he and his colleagues noted this incredible dynamic of you know, the poet and the artist and the scientist and the the programmer, all being together in the same room, uh, this high level of 
creativity and engagement and um, collaboration, um, it, it made them wonder, gee, wow, what, what would happen if more people had access to this kind of experience? Um, and so in addition to writing a book and creating a website as part of the community service component of the grant, um, he and his colleagues also boiled down the components of the mother lab into a suite of machines and processes and took it first to rural India in inner city Boston. And this photograph shows sort of the originators uh, of the Fab Lab project. Um, Sherry Lassiter on the left, who is now president of the Fab Foundation. Amy Sun, who was then a, grad, a doctoral uh, grad student with Gershenfeld. Amon Milner, um, who was also a, a doctoral student at the time. Uh, they both since graduated. And Amon is a professor at the Olin College of Engineering. And, and Mel King, who started the South End Technology Center in Boston, one of the first fab labs that has really uh, transformed lives. Um, so uh, the suite of machines, the, the good old vinyl cutter, uh, the CNC router, 3D printer, CNC router, and laser cutter uh, are the, the main components of the fab lab. Um, and, you know, as these went into communities, as, as you know, more and more people were pulling from them. And this is just showing some of the results um, of, you know, community-based problem solving and making. Um, sometimes the solutions were not particularly, um, you know, sophisticated, but they were fully functional. So, um, you know, creating um, a wireless internet, creating alternative housing, um, small cottage businesses, and also giving people the ability the technology to be able to improve their products and be able to uh, represent them, you know, so they could receive uh, greater benefit. And the project started out when I joined, there were about 500 labs and uh, you could fit everybody in a big room. Um, but since then, um, the network has grown to 1,750 labs and ever growing, uh, representing uh, 100 countries around the world. And so all the labs are connected, thank goodness, to the internet. Um, we can collaborate in real time. And the other beauty of it is um, that if you see, if you're, you know, wherever you are tuning in, um, if you see a project that I'm working on that you, you're interested in either reproducing or in um, uh, morphing it to, to suit your community, um, I don't have to send you the object. I don't have to ship it to you. I can send you the file um, over email, over the internet. And because you have the same, uh, theoretically, if you have access to a fab lab, you have the same equipment, you can produce um, this object um, on site, on demand. So it, it creates uh, a lot of opportunity for um, producing things without having to warehouse them, without having to, you know, store an inventory other than uh, materials. So, you know, part of the idea about Fab Lab, in my case, Fab Lab DC is a, an independent lab, so we're not held to, um, um, you know, strict standards or bureaucratic um, requirements. Um, we can pretty much do what we want to do. Um, clearly, some of our funding, um, we, we make commitments to carry out certain um, obligations. Um, as when we got started, we were basically um, just like theater, creating something out of nothing. Um, and, and part of the idea is that technology um, in many ways is something that we all consume through products. Um, and we were so excited about making the shift of using technology as a creative medium where you could use it to realize an idea. You could use it just to discover something new, to learn something. You could use it as a creative expression. Um, and so our initial uh, group, core group who, who um, sought us out. Um, many were architects, designers, artists, um, 
do-it-yourselfers. Um, and uh, through that vitality, um, when we had no resources, it was these volunteers who offered their time and their knowledge to um, be the people who taught workshops and also to engage in community projects um, that, that made a difference and showed the capability of what a fab lab can do. Um, and out of the network and out of this growing interest in fab labs became the, became the fab academy. And so essentially it's that graduate level course, how to make almost anything adapted for an online experience. So students tune in for a weekly um, lecture by Neil Gershenfeld, and then they carry out the experiences or the assignments rather in the lab. Um, and because accreditation is so tied to a place, a physical place and not a distributed network, um, the program isn't yet accredited. It, I'm sure accreditation will catch up. And so um, the way a, a student um, is accountable is by documenting their work, um, documenting the process, whether it um, is a success or a failure. Um, and at the end, uh, there's, there's basically a record of that. It's a shared repository and it's also, if you will, a portfolio um, for, the, for the student. Um, but as time's gone on, even Fab Academy has, has morphed into Academeni. Um, so in addition to Fab Academy, you have a Bio Academy, which delves into synthetic biology. Um, so it's more how you, um, how to grow anything. Uh, Fab Academy is, is sort of a synthesis of Fab Academy and Bio Academy where people are experimenting with um, making materials that we wear or use um, from materials that can be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly because um, as many of you know, just the dyeing process uh, of fabrics in our fashion industry is one of the most polluting things in our environment. And so there's a lot of innovation going on at, at Fab Academy, a lot of interest. And added to that is why to make, which is more the basis of design. It's sort of like, you don't wanna, do we make things just to make? Uh, yeah, there's some intrinsic value and satisfaction to um, using your hands and uh, creating an object. Um, but this goes a little more deeply into um, to the design process and questioning um, the ramifications too of, of what we make. And last of all, there's Fab Academy X. And this is really um, the opportunity to customize a learning experience for an organization, whether it be um, a business or a university or um, whomever. Um, and, and so, in terms of uh, Fab Academy and Fab Academy, um, it's, it's technology that, that actually makes that happen so that people all over the world can tune in and be part of a community that we otherwise um, you know, wouldn't have access to each other. Um, so it, it's already well positioned for a catastrophe like uh, COVID-19. Uh, where we have to isolate, but we still, we still have access. Um, this um, diagram is, is sort of a representation of uh, traditional education where you um, sign up to be taught how you get from point A to point B. And um, the Fab Many is a combination of sort of traditional uh, instruction, but the fab way is also just to either create your own map or have a map and you're the one that charts the course. So you typically start out with a final project at the beginning. You have to imagine your final project. What would you make if you could make almost anything? And what will you make? And it's not to decide by thinking, well, what am I capable of making? That's what I'll choose. It's, it's reaching beyond that and really flexing your imagination to think, what would I love to make if I could make almost anything? And so um, 
With that premise in mind, um, there's a series of traditional lessons where piece by piece, you learn different systems, you learn how to create a vector file, you learn um, how to um, uh, cut on the laser cutter, you learn how to um, use additive manufacturing with a 3D printer. Each lesson along builds you up to the capability of being able to create your final project. Um, this screen just shows everybody tuning in from the academy around the world. Um, and um, there was a conversation before we started the, this presentation with some of the people who are tuned in, including the um, person who runs the tech for Northeastern, about you know, how we can look forward to even creating more vibrant platforms to, to engage um, over the internet. Um, so this slide is essentially blank because right now um, with social isolation and um, you know recommendations from the major health organizations we can't really gather in person and um, this is um, you know it's just so almost devastating to um, to not allow people to have access. Um, of course, with imagination and inventiveness, um, people are uh, returning to, you know, making things with, without machines. Um, there's also uh, a stream in, in the FAB network um, about machines that make machines because these machines in the lab can actually replicate some of the machines we use. Um, and so the idea that we could create machines that could potentially be distributed to people who are not, you know, who have to be in their pod, their family or their, their um, group of housemates, but still have the ability to make things uh, using digital fabrication is, is, um, is promising. And then there's the, um, the wonderful response um, from the network in times of crisis. Um, this is a photograph of Shelter 2.0 um, created by um, Bill Young and, um, and his partner, Robert, who's sitting on top of this shelter. They initially um, developed this shelter for a catastrophe in Haiti um, so that people wouldn't have to sleep on the ground so that they would have shelter. Um, it, it essentially flat packs and can be shipped. Or if there's um, a CNC router um, in nearby, um, the files are open source and they can be downloaded and the material can be cut on the CNC router. Or if the catastrophe is so great and there's no electricity to run the CNC router, um, oftentimes um, the parts are pre-cut and they can be used as a template with, with hand tools to cut and, and then assemble. Um, most of, um, or originally these were uh, press fit construction, um, but some of them have been adapted to use uh, various types of, of hardware. And um, they were also deployed um, when the fires happened in California. Uh, they were produced um, and, and shipped so that people could have temporary shelters. Um, because the network um, is constantly adapting such ideas for use in their own countries or communities. In Peru, um, they've adapted the, the basic Shelter 2.0 for their needs. And all of this is documented and, and on the internet for other people to utilize and, and um, apply or, or change. And then of course, um, as has happened on the campus of Northeastern University um, during this COVID crisis, um, many makers and maker spaces have mobilized to create PPE. And it's been a huge boon for frontline workers, um, medical workers, and also, um, you know, workers. Um, so there's been some um, distribution to um, people who deliver the mail and, and um, you know, others who were 
out in the community um, doing their jobs for us. Um, the other thing that um, I just like to touch on briefly is um, the focus on the United Nations Sustainable Goals. Um, these are also things that have come to the forefront um, for, for the FAB community um, because climate change is, is such a, um, a pressing issue that we may not necessarily feel as we feel the, the COVID crisis. And the COVID crisis, of course, is uh, temporary, um, temporary until we have uh, vaccines and, and more immunity. Um, the, the climate crisis um, is not temporary. Um, and unless there's some efforts now, and we've seen some since we've all had to um, shelter, we've seen um, pollution reduced um, based on fewer emissions. Um, it, it provides the opportunity for us as we may have more time on our hands, um, having to isolate, um, to give pause and think about um, what realignments need to happen um, for us to meet these goals um, in terms of health, um, equalities, equity, um, politics, um, various partnerships, justice. Um, this surgence right now um, from people stepping up and stepping out to um, say what's important, to show what's important. Um, it has the potential for us not to forget about that once we resume our normal routines. Uh, maybe we won't resume our more normal routines. Maybe we'll put into play um, some conscious decisions and actions now and as we resume um, to be able to really start to change things. And I think um, we've seen how Technology has, has so um, changed our lives. And as is mentioned in um, uh, Joseph Owen's book, uh, Robot Proof, um, you know, how can we begin to develop the technology so we're more prepared to address and deal with um, the, these pressing issues that are both upon us now and that are definitely in our future. And so they, they don't come as a, a shock and surprise, um, but that we can incrementally um, create solutions um, and through powerful networks like the Fab Lab Network, um, we, we don't have to be isolated to our own studio, our own community, our own country the fluidity of being able to have conversations that aren't filtered through um, lenses and spectrums of people who are in control or who want to limit um, you know the kind of direct communication between citizens between um, people who care is is a really powerful phenomena um, so I, I think that like ro robot proof, um, the emphasis for humans on creativity and cultural agility and empathy um, are really the things that shine for, for we humans. Um, and, and I think we can use the robotics and the technology to, to really amplify those qualities. So um, with that, I'm not sure how long I've talked, long enough. Um, I'm gonna close my screen out and um, turn it back over to um, Benjamin so we can have a discussion. Wow, Phyllis, you've done some really amazing work over the years, I can see. Very, very exciting stuff. Uh, I wanna remind everybody that if you have any questions, you can post them to the chat window. Uh, and in the meantime, I have a few uh, questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned the Fab Academy Why to Make class. 
uh, and you said that that focuses on a bit of a bit of design. Let me, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about Fab Academy was what are those what are those age groups? Um, how young do they get? And within that why to make class, I, I'd love to, for you to elaborate on a couple of successful products that you came that came out of that um, that discussion. Sure. Um, so Fab Academy is is graduate almost a graduate level graduate. and so that's for adults but it's been adapted for young people in in many labs in my lab um the flexing of of the imagination uh the question what would you make if you could make almost anything is is a prevalent exercise we use uh, here in the lab, we may have young people coming in for a summer program, so we may have them come for eight weeks. Um, they may be coming for Fab Club, which is just a couple hours uh, per week over a series of weeks. Or we may have them come uh, just for almost like a, a field trip, because that's, you know, what, what's possible within the realm of their school or, or their group. Um, and at, at our lab, we feel like considering design and the, the, um, um, the hallmarks of design, um, considering what's been made before, you know, you may come up with an idea like, oh, I'm going to make, what is it? It's going to be something that I can carry with me that will give me a, a sense of comfort and confidence. I'll be able to speak into it and and record my ideas or my dreams, and I'll be able to, um, you know, save those for later, and I'll be able to record other things. And, and when you start to think about that, you're like, oh, no, that's already done. It's my phone. Uh, somebody already did that. Um, when you try to be original and think about inventing something, um, and then just look into what's already happened, you, you realize how many shoulders you're standing on for so many of the the things that we take for granted. But um, the why to make or why we make is not actually part of Fab Academy per se, it's part of uh, the Academy. And, um, and so right now that's, that's offered for adults. But, um, you know, as you know, from being in the lab, um, the, the underlying principles of design are present in anything you make, whether it be an earring or uh, a sophisticated robot. And, and, and I think um, in our culture, our culture isn't as robust in sensitivity to design. I think we're becoming more so. I think we're sensitive to, to product design because we're consumers. Um, I think some are more uh, sensitive to architecture and, and the, man, the, the people made environment. Um, and what I found here is our, um, one of the things we do with young people is we have them cre create a, a journal, their creative journal. So they, they create a logo or a design that they feel akin to or that represents them and they etch their, their um, journal on a laser cutter. And they, they carry this with them because now they're looking at the world with new eyes. They're looking at how things are made, uh, what is made, what needs to be made in their community, you know, what, what are solutions, and then just um, funny and creative thoughts or things that inspire them or that occur to them. And, uh, and so the journal becomes a really robust um, source, a springboard for inspiration to go on to designing. That's a long answer. Sorry. That was a fabulous answer. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, personally for me, I love to work with younger people and introduce this technology as, as early as you possibly can. Now I know that if, if I had uh, a 3D printer when I was in my teens, I would have probably gone into a different path completely, but boy, I really enjoy the process of 3D printing and how easy it is to share files and things like that. I'm curious, only uh, uh, a purely selfish reason because I'd like to work with some younger people at some point. What's the youngest 
students you've had working with 3D printing technology, maybe not even design, maybe just, you know, finding objects online to print and things like that. What's the youngest that you've had good success with? So, um, the youngest participant was five. And um, it was part of our after school group. And it was really great because we connected with a, a local school that's within walking distance. And we were so fortunate that some of the parents were willing to facilitate this. So um, once a week, um, about 10 students aging from five all the way to 14 would walk here to the lab with a parent or sometimes a, a couple parents. And um, the, the exercise that I would have them do is, it, it's essentially they would draw their idea. So they would come up with, with an idea and they would draw it. And it's so wonderful to see drawings by, by children. And once they drew their object, then we would scan it or, you know, they would draw, we would scan it. And depending on what process we were doing that particular day, if it was 3D printing, um, we would load that into a program, sometimes Morphe. I don't know if you've worked with Morphe. Um, the originator of Morphe would often come here um, and, and help with, with some of the offerings. And I can send you that information. She's wonderful. And so you can take a child's drawing and turn it into a 3D rendering, and then we would print them out. And so the child wouldn't necessarily be working with a sophisticated um, uh, program. Morphe's very child friendly, and, and they would have help, you know, the very young ones, but that they would get to, um, you know, use the program with, um, with someone sitting nearby and um, transform their two dimensional drawing into a three dimensional rendering. And then they got to see it printed out, which sometimes took a long time. So, you know, there was a little impatience on the part of some because we couldn't do it all at once, but we split it up so that some were. 3D printing, some were laser cutting, some were making vinyl decals. And these were all wonderful ways to render the idea physical because they could then take the sticker and put it on their, um, no, their computer or notebook. They could um, laser cut and um, you know, attach it to their backpack. Um, so all the processes um, you know, lent itself. And if there was waiting time, we also have, you know, a lot of scissors and glue and other materials that one can use to make without having it be digital. So everybody was happy and, and satisfied. So that, that particular exercise is draw, digitize, make. And, and it became a lesson because other people wanted it. And I'm, I'm happy to send it to you if, if you'd like. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always collecting as much free, uh, free software as possible so that you can really try to keep this stuff uh, accessible by people. And yeah, I have a lot of resources for you. In fact, in addition to Fab Academy and all the, the online things for children, there's something called um, scopes that came out of Fab Academy. And I didn't include that on the slide and I meant to. Scopes is really a... a a wonderful platform for educators, you know, and so there's projects that um, have been created by uh, the Fab Foundation and Scopes, and then they've also created a repository for projects that educators have um, successfully created and implemented, and they're sharing with others. So um, perhaps there's a way, and um, Kelly might be able to tell me where I could um, share some resources for those who have tuned in, um, you know, after we, we finish the session. That's really great. That's really great. Scopes. I'm going to have to take a look at that. Um, I was with, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a colleague of mine 
during the pandemic had a call to maker spaces uh, uh, and we had a whole bunch of maker space or he had a whole bunch of maker spaces building PPE. Did your maker space get involved in any of that? I know not every maker space could because of, of uh, distancing requirements and state things, but did you guys do anything with that? So we didn't directly. Um, Open works is a wonderful facility in Baltimore. And I think they produce like, I want to say 9,000, uh, shields. Um, early on, we were going to gear up to do it, but there was some controversy. You know, a lot of people jumped in and started producing things that couldn't be used because right, right. they have to be sterile or they have to fit. And so the nice thing that OpenWorks did is they put out a call for people to make little parts and then they did the assembling according to what, um, you know, Johns Hopkins and some other facilities needed. So. We um, were a conduit for getting information out, but we didn't actually produce in the lab. Um, one of the, and, and you know, people would come to us, for instance, um, there's a member in our community who um, was born with one ear and she was having a really difficult time wearing a mask. And so um, uh, a boy who was in the Boy Scouts um, had developed a, a, whole, a thing that goes around the back of your head and holds the um, elastic for the masks. And it was developed for, um, you know, first line workers because it just, you know, it gets painful after a while. And um, so he developed it for that. And um, this young woman had seen that invention and contacted us to see where she could have it made. And it just so happened that Bill Young, who did Shelter 2.0, was producing these, not, you know, originally they were intended for 3D printing, but it, it takes a really long time. So he adapted the file and he was cutting them on the CNC router and distributing them. So we connected the person who really needed this with the person who was producing it. And yeah, and that worked out really well. And, and from my experience, it was absolutely invaluable to have those resources available for the public to to get into. And this is this is what I was what what I was getting at was is that you know there was there were so many people building and there were so many people that were headed down sort of questionable paths and where too many people were jumping into doing the design work. And it was really interesting to see places like yours uh, uh, sharpen their pencils and put out approved designs, suggested designs. If you are gonna make PPE, here's how you should do it. Um, and it was just amazing to see all of these groups come together to, to do this kind of work. Really beautiful stuff, really I, I sat in on a convening that MIT did of the Fab Lab Network and I was just astounded. Um, it wasn't just like producing, um, you know, an existing file, but there was all this imagining about um, um, what resources are available to, you know, create certain kinds of masks. There was all kinds of invention happening. Um, it, it was quite extraordinary. Um, but unfortunately in our lab, um, we, we don't have, we don't have the space to like invite people in at this time and safely operate. Sure, so, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, another question real quick. Um, what's the favorite project that you've seen come out of Fab Lab DC? Don't be shy. <laughs> wow. Um, or projects, maybe you could say. Well, gee, there's been, there's been so many. Um, uh, um, in terms in terms of, um, hmm, well, I'll, I'll say that it's, it's so satisfying for me to see people pursuing a project, you know, whether it be the, the elementary school kids um, and, and a lot of our core group members who are extraordinarily talented um, to be able to witness their process and learn from them um, and see many of them go on to 
advanced uh, learning situations, you know, to go on to their master's and um, doctorate degrees at, at really exciting places. Um, but, you know, rather than the, the physical thing, uh, what really stands out for me is when people come and what's transformed is the way that they see themselves. Even adults, you know, we had some engineering students from George Washington University come here because surprisingly at their university, they're not allowed to touch the machines, you know, uh, maybe when they get to, to be seniors, but they came here for, um, um, for an exercise in um, human centered design. And at the beginning of the exercise, um, actually, when we took a break, there was one woman among um, her male counterparts. And I asked her how the program was and how she liked it. And, um, you know, I was happy that she was there. And she said, well, you know, I don't really think of myself as creative. You know, I'm an engineer. So I, I execute. Um, I rely on others, you know, to do the creation. And then, you know, I, I do the technical thing. And I said, hmm, okay. okay. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we went through the exercise. And at, at the end, I was so astounded at what she came up with. And these are um, low fidelity solutions that are, you know, created very quickly. And, um, and we spoke after. And, you know, she just had a, she just seemed to say, you know what, you know, maybe I was really limiting myself with that message. And I think that's a pretty prevalent experience here. And that's one that fuels me is to see people change the way they think about their own capabilities and change the way they think about others, you know, uh, rather than coming in and, and sort of, um, being judgmental or um, competitive. I think um, when you provide access uh, to, to diverse groups of people, um, what, what I really like are the elements of like respect and trust and goodwill and sharing and, and common purpose, you know, that come out of it. And so I'm sure there's like things that people have made that, that I like, but I, I kind of like the, the meta stuff that, that happens around the things. Boy, I tell you, I completely agree with that. There's nothing like steering, like, like listening to a student and helping them develop an idea and then just sort of pointing them a little bit in a slightly different direction than maybe they were thinking and then all of a sudden, poof, they're gone and they, they've got it. There's nothing more exciting about that. You know, I think the, the joy of discovery um, is something that you see you know, in a very concentrated way uh, in these kinds of settings, you know, and I, I think it's wonderful for more people to experience uh, studio practice and studio setting where you might come with an idea and follow that thread for a period of time, or you might come without an idea and just start tinkering and, and that sense of discovery will ultimately lead you onto something. I completely agree with that. One of, one of the biggest challenges that I have with my students, well, I shouldn't say, you know, I, I, I find a great, there's a couple of really great ways to, to overcome it. One of, one of their holdbacks is, well, wh how, do you, how do I do something that hasn't been done before? And it's like, you have to give them the confidence to, to try to experiment and know that if the experiment goes wrong, that's not a failure, that's a learning experience. So every time, so there's no such thing in failure as design, it's everything as an experience that leads you to success and you just have to be part of that process. Uh, is that one of the, right, right, you, I, I can see you smiling. Is that something that you work at combating with your students is to, to get over that idea of failure, that failure is a learning process? Well, I, I think that, um there's a certain apprehension when someone comes into the lab, you know, there, there's a little bit of an intimidation. Um, and we try to make it an environment where um, it's, none of us know everything. And I certainly um, 
learned as I went along and I'm still learning and yeah. I'll, I'll always be learning. And so I think that um, I've, I've had to deal with, with some people being dashed and totally disappointed and feeling like I can't, you know, that, that feeling, oh, I just can't. And so for instance, we often do sewable circuits and to learn about electricity and make something flashy and wearable. And some of the students, they just, they wanted to give up. And I said, well, you know what? Sewing isn't the only way. We have this copper um, adhesive. Maybe you wanna make your connections with the copper adhesive instead of sewing. So in some cases, knowing that the route you're on isn't the only way. If you're, if you're not succeeding at it, well, let's try this. Um, but I think the notion of failure is so pervasive in our culture that it stops people from wanting to even try. And so we, we deal with that a lot here. And um, you've probably heard the yet. Well, some might say, I can't do that. And we'll say, yet, you know. Um, but I think um, we all, you know, grapple with the frustration we might be riding the high of the idea and then when we try to implement oh it's so hard and, and difficult but it's that sticking with it and um traversing the the waves of the exhilaration and the the more neutral or disappointing feelings and i think that's valuable in every aspect of our lives <laughs> so absolutely good lesson Oh, well, Phyllis, I, I want to thank you on behalf of Northeastern University and the College of Arts, Media and Design. I want to thank you so much for speaking today. It was really, it was really inspirational to hear about your endeavors. And you're one of the few people who I'm sure loves their job. You're so lucky to be doing what you're doing. It's wonderful. It really, really is. Well, I, I so appreciate um, your time, Ben, and, and the questions. And um, I'll be circling back to offer you some resources and um, please, please do to uh, the next um, offering here next week. Excellent. And I just want to add when things are different around and never people are traveling more freely, etc. Please come visit us in our makerspace. I will. My daughter is, uh, well, is in Boston in graduate school, but now that it's virtual, um, you know, She'll be here, but I'll be back in Boston, so I will definitely come see you all. Please do, please do. I'd love to have you come and give us a quick, a, a quick talk to my class and show us a few things. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was Thank you. awesome. It was great. Thank you.